Hello everyone, welcome to another sketchbook tour. I called it Zebra because I figured it was going to be a, a black and white sketchbook, mostly ink and uh, graphite, um, although there's a little bit of color in it. I also chose the Z as the name since this is a Stillman and Burn Zeta, um, which I liked quite a bit. It's very portable, uh, the paper is very nice, it uh, accepts ink really, really well, doesn't bleed pretty much at all. My only issue is that it smudged a bit, um, probably because it was getting tossed around inside of a backpack quite a lot. So right here on this first page, I was playing around with a couple of new pens I had just bought. Um, on the top there, the very top, where you see the black and gray, which is going to be kind of a recurring theme throughout this sketchbook. Those are from my Pilot Futayaku double-sided brush pen, uh, which is a really cool pen. It's got gray ink on one side and black ink on the other. But right here, this was I think the first time I'd ever tried them, so I was just playing around with some very simple little symbols and uh, giving them some shading. You'll see in the middle of the page there, I kind of played around with doing some different attempts at shadowing on a, on a simple cube object. And then uh, the bottom two images, I started getting a little bit more in-depth and creative with the sleeping dragon and the uh, pillars rising up out of the clouds. And then at the top middle of the page, that tree, that was drawn with my Pentel Arts pocket brush pen. Uh, before I used to use more technical pens, like uh, Microns were one of my favorites, and um, that encouraged a very simple, consistent line style that was actually a lot more limiting than I realized. So once I started playing around with these, uh, I ended up having a lot more fun with them. Here on the second page, I started playing around with a couple of other media just to see how the paper would handle it. On the top left there is graphite uh, for my favorite Castell pencils. Um, I do like the way this image looks, but you can see it's smudged a bit um, both on around it and on the opposite page. Uh, the pages of this book sit pretty tightly together, so if they're uh, rubbing around at all, uh, it can easily have that effect. And this is something that you find with a lot of sketchbooks. I don't think it's ever entirely avoidable, but that was discouraging enough to me that I just decided to stick with ink for the rest of using this. Below that, you'll see when I first um, started to really get the feel for the uh, the gray and black ink um, from the Pilot pens. I'm not sure what you call this exactly. It's not exactly a 3D, but it's sort of a faux 3D map, something you find in like an old video game strategy guide maybe. Um, I really like the depth that you get with the gray ink though. It's just kind of amazing how that one extra tone gives you so much more freedom. On the upper right there, you'll see that traffic cone. This is one of the only places you're going to see any color in this whole sketchbook. I was trying to take my uh, favorite Castell Polychromos colored pencils and blend them with uh, some odorless solvent, uh, which I've done a lot before on other papers, and really didn't work here at all. <laughs> it got very smeary. Um, the blue was supposed to kind of blend into the orange and make a nice shadow effect, and instead you can very clearly see the streaks where uh, I moved the brush around. So I decided this is not a great paper uh, for that particular colored pencil blending technique. I can't quite remember what I used on the right there for the moon's background. That was either the Pentel brush pen or it might have been black paint. And I think the white on there is white gouache. In the middle there I'm using Echoline liquid watercolor. That looks really great on watercolor paper, but it doesn't work very well on this kind of really smooth stock, um, especially because it tends to separate in a sort of curious way. Even though this is black watercolor, it has a sort of a yellowish dye in there somewhere that sometimes kind of creeps to the edges, and you can't see it very well in this video, but uh, it's definitely noticeable. So I kind of gave up on using that too, but it was worth an experiment. And then at the bottom there, I just decided to try out a couple of uh, basic human faces uh, with some shading. Didn't quite work, I don't think, but I'm still struggling, honestly, with uh, drawing faces. It's one of the hardest things for me, so I'm trying to do more practice on that all the time. Here I'm starting to play around with lighting effects a little bit, uh, especially that the glowing floating diamond thing and that flare effect around the mountain. I wanted to see uh, just how much I su could suggest with uh, the gray and black ink, just some experiments. I also drew an eye, which is, for whatever reason, one of the things I draw most frequently. I just really am fascinated by the shapes of eyes. Um, that's the one part of the human face I'm actually kind of good at. It's the whole rest of the face that I struggle with. And then on the right side, I'm uh, playing around a bit with some architecture, a tree, that little vignette in the middle with the uh, sort of despondent, angry-looking drunk guy and his Muppet friend. Um, I feel like I should revisit sometime. There's, there's a story there. I don't know what it is. I was just doodling, but uh, I like where that's going. And at the bottom I have a, some kind of a speedboat. It's sort of um, inspired a little bit by those really expensive water taxis they have in Venice, if you've ever been there, except a little bit more futuristic, but with, uh, with a bit of an 
Art Nouveau style to it. This page I tried a couple of realistic portraits in pen, uh, both of which I would call flat out failures. Uh, the top one is my daughter and the bottom one is me. Um, these are based off of photos uh, and you can sort of see the distortion of the photos um, coming into my drawing, which is one of the reasons it's really hard to accurately do portraits from a photo sometimes, um, because you don't notice the distortion when you're looking at the photo, but when you try to accurately model the face, you find you start getting measurements wrong, which I, I'm going to use that as my excuse for why these don't look great. Uh, but once again, I'm not great at drawing the human head, uh, so I just need to keep practicing. Uh, the right side of this page worked out a lot better. Um, that top part there, I was trying to see if I could get some basic atmospheric effects using the range of the black and gray ink. Um, so I kind of tried to leave those white outlined buildings in the background to suggest that they're uh, getting flared out a little bit by the brightness of the sky. I think it uh, works out fairly well. Uh, the bottom there is uh, me playing around a bit more with atmospherics by rendering the background all with gray ink so it looks farther away, and then rendering this robot character in the front with a black outline. He's got a very awkward pose with his arm there. Um, that was not really intentional. That's what happens when you just start drawing with no pencil under drawing. On this page you see a little bit more color. I was trying to just do ink outlines and then uh, color them in with colored pencil, not using any solvent this time, just blending them normally. I'm still playing around with atmospherics. I was trying to get a sort of gradient effect on the sky there in that uh, desert alien world scene we see. On the right, I started playing around with looser brushwork with that uh, Pentel pen. And uh, we see an actual study I tried of uh, doing an object that was right in front of me that was a tea kettle uh, on the stove. And I wanted to see how well I could capture the chrome effects of it with the gray and black ink. That worked out pretty well. And at the bottom, I have just a very cartoony car. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know where that came from. It looks like something out of Roger Rabbit or something like that. This is definitely one of my better pages. Uh, the upper left there, uh, I'm starting to get more confident, I think, with my, uh, my whole atmospheric suggestion of a, of a receding background with the gray ink. Um, I really like the way the orc turned out in the front. I think that once I'm not trying to draw a human anymore, I start to relax a bit and I actually end up drawing surprisingly more anatomically correct faces. Both the bottom of the left page and the entire right page are uh, two takes of the same image. Uh, I did the right one first, and it didn't quite work out, um, so I kind of sat down and tried to figure out what it is exactly. This is a scene from a graphic novel I'm working on that maybe I'll finish someday, in which a team of uh, airship adventurers gets attacked by a giant sea serpent in the middle of a storm in the ocean, and I really wanted to try to capture as much of the scene as possible in a single image. So I drew the serpent grabbing at um, some rigging on the ship there, and I just kind of improvised it a little bit, but I ended up going a little nuts with the, uh, the black ink and making the whole scene uh, actually kind of uh, monotone and boring. There's just no real sense of, uh, of a strong light source even though all of the light is supposed to be coming from that uh, lightning bolt. And there's just too many lines. It's, uh, it's confusing to the eye. It's, it doesn't really draw you in as well as it should. So I redid it uh, smaller as well. Um, and I think it works out much better on the left side there where uh, the, as you can see, the, the darkest darks for the most part are on the serpent and on the silhouette of the airship. So they really stand out. And uh, I lightened up the sky, so uh, that also makes their silhouettes clearer and uh, gives more of a sense that the uh, lightning is actually casting all of the light in the scene and then also really emphasizing the shadow of the serpent on the wave on the lower right uh, with that large white expanse, which I think helps make it feel more like it's part of the scene. Intertwining trees was an image that I had that seems very symbolic, but it's not really meant to symbolize anything. It just was kind of an interesting image that came to me. Um, playing around a little bit with really stark shadows there, uh, kind of the opposite of what I've been experimenting with with the gray ink, just seeing how much I can establish with uh, as little detail as possible and just by placing the shadows in the right place. The bottom left, uh, I'm just doing some silhouettes of islands. I find that silhouettes of natural figures are really incredibly fun for me to do and very forgiving. Uh, it's one of the easiest kinds of drawings for me personally. Uh, on the right side there, that chimney I know is something I actually saw from the train window and then had to kind of keep working on it from memory because we didn't stay there very long. Uh, the sword in the ice with the little Muppety looking figure climbing over the edge is not a particular story, but maybe like the earlier Muppet story, uh, I could tie it into something eventually. That figure on top of the pyramidal 
looking uh, rooftop is an actual uh, building in Chicago along the uh, river uh, that I actually only saw pretty far away from a distance, but I wanted to capture. And that's also a street light, which was not on when I drew it, but uh, I thought it would look more interesting if I tried to render the actual light effects. On the left, I'm just trying out some more natural subjects, as well as a little bit of architecture there in a very cartoony way. The, very, the loose brushwork that I'm doing, uh, especially on the upper right of the left-hand page, I think it looks quite a bit like some Calvin and Hobbes backgrounds, um, which was a huge inspiration to me growing up, and I don't think it's an accident that I'm starting to imitate it um, as I'm using the same, you know, a brush that's a little bit closer to what Bill Watterson was using. The hand there that's glowing, I'm trying out uh, what I recently learned are called Kirby Crackles, that comic book effect that suggests energy. I wanted to see if I could again, do a more convincing lighting effect with just the black and gray ink. And I think it, I'm starting to get a little better at it here uh, than I was earlier. And then on the right side is a plain air drawing that I did uh, when I was in London in December. So there was a lot of Christmas decorations around. I was actually originally planning on drawing the whole scene in front of me, which is at a really pretty little area called St. Catherine Docks. But um, it got very cold and I didn't have any gloves. So that was about as much as I could manage to do before I needed to head inside. These are some more plain air sketches from London. There was a really interesting and strange uh, sculpture slash fountain that I saw, the, the person kind of suspended on top of the dolphin. And uh, then the tower there is part of the Tower Bridge. And the sailboat uh, was also from St. Catherine Docks. That was the first time I actually used my pen to measure proportions. And I'm really glad I did because the um, mast of the ship was much, much taller when I actually measured it than I would have guessed it was just from looking at the boat. It's funny how your eye will kind of change the proportion of things based on their you know, perceived significance to you. These are just some more sketches, not based directly on any London ex architecture, but definitely inspired by them. Um, the, the house there was something that was a little bit like the Tower Bridge originally, and then I just kind of thought it'd be cooler as a creepy manor in the woods somewhere. Um, the person silhouetted isn't based on anything, I just uh, had an image of that particular pose. The upper right there is actually an image that struck me when I was looking at the Tower of London uh, in the morning, and right behind it, well not right behind it, actually quite a distance behind it was the Shard, which is this tall, very modern skyscraper. And I love that juxtaposition of the two, of the very old kind of stone castle with this ultra-modern, shiny glass and steel skyscraper. So I thought I would push that even a little bit farther and make the castle even more old and crumbled and the architecture even more futuristic. And I ended up turning this into a bigger a uh, painting that I did in case scene uh, a couple weeks after this. And the person on the lower right there is very creepy looking and not, not meant to be anyone in particular. She's supposed to have like a cyborg implant eye um, on her left eye, uh, but I don't think it really looks like that. It looks more like she was just injured in some way. I have no further explanation. The top left there are some sketches of uh, John Zack, who's one of my co-workers, very nice guy, uh, did not mind being sketched, even when I was trying to hide that I was doing it and he saw right through me. Below are some more silhouetted natural subjects. Uh, the tropical island there actually I think I overdid a bit, it kind of got messy and it's hard to tell the difference between the clouds in the background and the mountains that are in sort of in the mid-middle area, uh, but the stuff below it works a lot better. On the right, a couple of sci-fi treatments, uh, not really based on anything in particular. The, although the now that I look at it, the architecture of the building on the top right looks kind of like the aliens' heads from the Alien movies. And this next set of pages are from Hourly Comic Day, uh, which I did in February of 2018. This is, uh, for those of you who don't know, this is uh, where you try to write a short comic for every hour you're awake all day and just capture your entire day. Um, I don't think it has to be autobiographical, but that's what pretty much everybody does. And it's really fun to look through these different artists and see what their daily lives are like and how they kind of try to capture the little bits of humor and interest in uh, the mundane aspects of their lives. These might be kind of hard to read here, so I'll put a link to where I posted all of these after the fact. These drawings here are all master studies of uh, an artist named Nesta Redondo who did some really cool work. Uh, in this case, I was copying off of uh, an old illustrated classics version of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. I just thought that he made these really incredibly striking images. I love the, the high contrast and the way he uses shadows and his clever use of line work to sort of both suggest shadow and texture in really economical ways. And it was hard to capture really, especially because I think I was working a lot smaller than he was, uh, but it was a really fun challenge and I think I learned a lot about uh, good inking line work from it. Here I'm playing around with natural scenes, which is sort of my comfort zone on the top there, and then below that you'll see 
Drawing the same character consistently from different angles, which is the opposite of my comfort zone. I always have a really hard time with that. So it's something I tried to practice a little more. On the upper right there, uh, I was playing with some character ideas and I thought it'd be interesting to try to just draw the silhouettes of the characters. Um, because I've always heard that having a distinct silhouette is really important in making characters uh, distinguishable and uh, memorable. Then some sort of failed attempts at human heads once again, and you can see I probably, in frustration, just drew a tree because that was something I knew I'd be able to draw correctly. Getting back into some sci-fi treatments here, this is a, a spaceship in space, uh, something I used to draw all the time when I was younger, but this was, I think, the first time I ever drew a spaceship with any kind of attempt at realistic lighting. And I was, I'm amazed how much it pops off the page compared to the stuff I would draw when I was younger. On the lower left there is a sort of fanciful floating city concept I had, um, and my attempt at futuristic fashion. Fashion is not really my strong point in real life, but uh, it's, you know, fun to try to make something that looks like it would plausibly be comfortable and interesting to wear, uh, but definitely doesn't look like something anyone would wear today. The right side, those silhouettes I'm drawing, those are for my wife's uh, dissertation. She needed some uh, icons for some of the charts she was making. The subject of her dissertation was indigenous weavers in Chile, and uh, this was supposed to represent childcare. This page you will start to see comics from an exquisite corpse I did with uh, some friends of mine who are uh, also local comics artists. So th this is not a full story. Uh, if you want to see the full story, I'll post the link below. Um, it was a lot of fun to do this. I, uh, I really enjoy this kind of exercise just because of the, the wild swerves that a story can take and seeing how everybody contributes their own kind of voice and style to it. Really a lot of fun. And that very tall tree there was just me filling up space that I hadn't been using because there wasn't enough room for another set of panels because I'd made the first ones too big, and I hate to waste space. I feel like with every sketchbook I have kind of a favorite spread, and this is probably my favorite of this particular sketchbook. Even though it does have human faces, which are not that great on the upper left, I feel like the rest of it kind of makes up for it. I wasn't using any reference for these, which is probably mostly my downfall, but every time I think, oh, you know, maybe this time I'll actually get it right, and... I do get a little bit better every single time, but I'm still still working on it. Uh, the lower left there, I really like that, the way the different values suggest distance. On the right side are some concept sketches for a video game idea I had, uh, which I still haven't pursued, and I honestly don't know if I ever will. I basically had been playing No Man's Sky for a while, uh, which is a game I really enjoy, but sometimes I just wish the game were a lot more fast-paced, and so I thought of a simple very pared down, kind of 16-bit style, cartoony version of the same thing that was a little bit more inspired by the Spaceman Spiff adventures from Calvin and Hobbes, where you would just kind of fly at breakneck speed around the galaxy, constantly crash land on planets and get shot down and have to run around facing off against ridiculous aliens. Um, with very really little in the way of consequences or stakes, just goofy, fast-paced fun. Maybe one of these days I'll work on it. On the upper left here, I'm doing some character sketches for that graphic novel, uh, the same one with the sea serpent from earlier, you might recognize the airship there. And then I tried rendering a desert on the bottom there. The darkness on the shadow in the foreground looks a little weird compared to the relative lightness of the shadows in the background. That was supposed to be a suggestion of distance, but I think it's a little bit too extreme. And then again, some more silhouettes of trees and rocks, uh, I just love doing that. And then you have my final entry in The Exquisite Corpse, uh, which comes just before the ending of the story. Here in the upper left is an image I had. I think that this this comes from, I, I have some old notebooks and trapper keepers from the 90s. They often had goofy little painted vignettes like this. One of them has, in my case, a, a spaceship taking off with a, this horrible scaly alien clawing up onto it and terrifying the person on board. This is like sort of the opposite scenario where this horrifying alien has appeared and the person in the spaceship clearly does not care and is just doing their nails. Below that, sort of a whimsical figure on a cloud, almost like something out of Mary Poppins a little bit. Um, and I was trying to do cloud shadows on the landscape in the background, but I think I was running out of ink here. You can see that some of the gray ink on the bottoms of the clouds is smudging a bit, so that's probably why I cut that one short before I really finished it. On the right is my attempt to draw an Ani Mae style. I'd been reading Magic Knight Ray Earth, and at least a couple of these sketches are, are directly based on parts of the comic, um, and I have a really hard time doing it. I, uh, I'm one of the few artists I know who never went through the manga Ani Mae phase when they were kids or teenagers, um, so I just kind of skipped that entirely. Uh, but I do sometimes really enjoy that the expressiveness of the huge eyes and uh, wanted to try my hand at it, so I was just playing around. Uh, on the bottom of the page there, where you see uh, this representation of a rabbit hole, that's a sketch that I did for a product called Inclusion Cards uh, that my company Table XI 
uh, launched a Kickstarter for, um, and I was doing some of the art concepts for it, and I'm still doing that now as I record this. Uh, you can actually, the Kickstarter is now over and it was successful, so we are going to be producing the cards. Um, I'll put a link below so you can check those out more. They're a really cool tool for making meetings uh, more inclusive, more interesting, and uh, just a lot better. So this page, I have very few explanations for any of it. I was doodling this when I was manning a booth at a conference and I was kind of bored. So the, the floating the light thing with those rocks or with runes on them around it. I don't know. It looks like something that would be very important in some kind of sci-fi movie or video game, uh, but it wasn't really based on anything. The person in the hoodie walking away from the trident in the uh, on the shore uh, was again just, just kind of an image that came to me at the moment, uh, but I like that it implies some kind of a story, uh, even if I'm not crazy about the fact that the shadow of the trident goes straight down like that, which is very visually confusing. Um, the weird masks over there, no reasoning behind those, but they do look pretty cool. Um, same thing with the glove. Uh, and finally, we have a, something I can't explain is the person running on that uh, math chart there. That's going off on a tangent. I was doing a little, little geometry pun there. Um, and that is one of the cards for the Inclusion Cards Kickstarter. On the upper left, we have a few more sketches for the Inclusion Cards. This is the Devil's Advocate card. Uh, I was trying to just suggest a person in a sort of generic silhouette sort of way, um, since these are called inclusion cards. I don't want to make the features of the person too distinct. Um, I want it to be able to kind of stand in for anyone, which is why I make a lot of use of silhouettes. That more uh, detailed devil figure I did there, um, I think was pretty heavily based on The Girl from the Other Side, which is a manga I had just been reading, and is a really cool read. I definitely recommend it. And then below that, I started just doing some urban scenes in ink, uh, it was raining when I was sketching this, so that definitely inspired these. On the middle of the right page is uh, a character sketch from uh, my group's second Exquisite Corpse, which was very different from the first one, and uh, had very manga-inspired fantasy characters. And the, the main one, um, Odeanix, has this huge mane of hair, uh, which was really a lot of fun to draw. So much fun that I just decided to draw a sketch of her that was pretty much all hair. Uh, and then at the bottom there, once again, some silhouetted trees and nature, um, mountains, clouds, trees. That's uh, my bread and butter, pretty much. On the left side of this page is my uh, mock-up, my first mock-up for the cover of our Exquisite Corpse. We got, we're so proud of this comic, even though it's honestly ridiculous and the story goes all over the place and it's very hard to follow, but we just love it. So we actually are planning on printing it, and I thought it'd be fun to uh, design a cover uh, and come up with a title for it. So I came up with The Last Cycle, uh, which ties into... Well, I don't even know if I can explain it. <laughs> You'll just have to read the comic yourself. I'll link it below. Um, and in the final cover, those those shattered areas in the background are going to contain little vignettes from uh, the various parts of the comic. And then on the right side of the page, I started playing around with really abstracted, almost hieroglyphic style versions of uh, the same kind of imagery and some of the images from the comic. And then I started playing around with faces again, some weird kind of sci-fi things. <laughs> one's kind of a machine, one's like some sort of cyber tree. At this point, as I get closer to the end of a sketchbook, I'm kind of eager to just finish it so I can uh, start the next one. So I, I just kind of start drawing whatever comes to my head. This spread here uh, was a lot of fun to do. Definitely pretty difficult. I did it with no rulers, which was a really stupid idea. I just tried to use my pen as much as possible to kind of line up the vanishing points. Um, so it doesn't work perfectly, but you know, it is a sketchbook, so it, it's just for fun. Um, this kind of superhero-y cityscape was definitely inspired by uh, the passing of Stan Lee, which happened uh, just a few days before I did this. I think I was thinking a lot about what uh, the characters he created in those comics meant to me uh, growing up and today. Uh, I think a lot of people were in that time, so I wanted to draw a little tribute. So this one is uh, definitely for Stan Lee. And that's the end. I uh, decided, since I had this one last page here to work with, I would uh, put the title card there. And I started doing these kind of abstract zebra-inspired designs, which gave it a very early 90s kind of look. It seems like something in like the credits of like In Living Color or something, which wasn't intentional, but just kind of happened. And that concludes this sketchbook. Thanks a lot for watching. I, uh, I'm hard at work at some other sketchbooks now, most of which are going to have color and paint uh, and be very different than this. So I uh, hope you'll stick around and check those out. Thanks a lot for watching.